Happy Saturday, everybody. After we dropped that upbeat history playlist into our feed, not long after the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic, a listener Emily sent us a note with suggestions for topics to include if we decided to do another one. We are replaying one of those topics as our classic episode today. And I love this topic. Uh, it's Dazzle Camouflage, and it originally came out on September 3rd, 2014. Thank you, Emily, for the suggestion. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of military history today, World War I specifically. And this particular little uh, story combines military strategy with art and even a little bit of a grudge match. Uh, you may have seen photos of World War I ships painted with what's called dazzle camouflage. And if you haven't, you are in for such a visual treat because they look amazing. It's all very geometric and cool. Uh, it will often show up in lists where, you know, people are like, look, 10 historical photos that aren't Photoshopped. And uh, as sort of a mind boggling, why on earth is this so amazing type of uh, article stance? But And they are really fabulous to look at. But most people do not know that there is a lot more to the story than meets the eye, including some some angriness about who actually should get attribution. There is a very popular version of the whole Dazzle camouflage story, and that's where we are going to start. Yeah, in 1917, uh, British Navy ships were being sunk by German U-boats in nothing short of devastating numbers. It was an incredible challenge to conceal ships on the open seas. Some of this was due to the weather. Since the weather is constantly changing at sea, you can't really make one camouflage that's going to effectively disguise the ship no matter what the conditions are like. And another problem is that it's not just the ship's uh, the ship itself that gives its location away. The ship leaves a wake, there are smoke trails, all these other signals betrayed the ship's positions. So U-boats would identify their targets and then they would plot their predicted courses. So then after calculating the speed at which they were traveling and confirming the ship's trajectory, it was torpedo time. So they would aim their torpedoes into the predicted path of the ship and, you know, the ship would intersect with it and be sunk. And the German Navy was very good at identifying ships and predicting their movements. So, of course, because it was facing huge losses, the British Navy wanted nothing more than to figure out a way to thwart the enemy and save the fleet from being attacked. But this was really easier said than done. Even if they could find effective camouflage for a ship so that you couldn't physically see it, that really only solved part of the problem. The wake and the smoke would still give the Germans a a way to target the ship. And, uh... It turns out, and I love this, that, you know, art came to the rescue. (laughs) The man who's normally credited with brainstorming the solution to this problem was Navy Lieutenant and artist Norman Wilkinson. And he had this idea that since they couldn't hide the ships, they could maybe at least do something to confuse the enemy. So his idea was a form of disruptive camouflage, and that took on the name Dazzle Camouflage. His idea was that painting ships with wild geometric patterns would kind of bewilder the sailors on the U-boats as they tried to look through the periscopes to find the targets. And of course, the ships would still be visible, but their disruptive geometric paint patterns would confuse the eye so much that it would be difficult to determine which direction the ship was facing, what direction it was moving, and at what speed. Wilkinson was given a ship to paint as a proof of concept, and before long, there were lots more ships being painted with wild designs as well. There were hundreds of different geometric schemes that were laid out for painting ships, and each one was meant to trick the eye with one or more optical illusions. Yeah, in some cases, curves along the sides of the ships would be painted to create sort of false wave patterns that kind of mirrored the wake that was going in the opposite direction, so it was a duplicate, but they were going in both directions, so it was hard to know what was actually happening. Uh, The smokestacks were painted with tilted and asymmetrical bands of color to make it look like the ship might be going the opposite way than it actually was. Uh, Diagonal lines were often painted in bright colors at either end of the ship to make it difficult to discern the fore from the aft. 
Some of the ships were painted in schemes of stripes that went in all different directions and used a multitude of colors. And these basically tried to prevent an observer from getting his bearings on exactly what he was looking at. I feel like these were colossally huge magic eye paintings. Yeah, I mean, it's not dissimilar from that. It really is just sort of so much information thrown at your your eyes that you can't really discern kind of what you're looking at. So you stand back and cross your eyes. I'm so good at magic eyes. That's like my superpower. But <laughs> before we get to an alternate version of this story, do you want to pause for a moment for a word from our sponsor? So now back to what was going on actually a few years before Wilkinson. So Wilkinson is often credited with the idea of applying dazzle camo to ships, but the concept had actually been floated several years prior by a man who was named John Graham Kerr. And Kerr was a naturalist. Uh, He actually made his name in lungfish embryology, so nothing having to do with ships. But several years before Wilkinson entered the picture as a proponent of disruptive camouflage, Kerr had approached the Admiralty with the idea. Because of all his work as a naturalist, Kerr had witnessed firsthand the success of naturally occurring disruptive coloration in animals. So many, many years before World War I, when he was traveling on an expedition in South America in 1891, he noted, quote, obliterative coloring on many of the animals that he observed, and he made these notes repeatedly in his field journals. He was clearly really, really fascinated by it. And uh, in 1902, he became the chair of zoology, although when he initially took the chair, it was called the chair of natural history. Uh, and then changed the next year at the University of Glasgow. And throughout his career, even while he was working on his embryology projects, he continued to study animal coloration, sort of as just a, a side interest. While his day job was all about zoology, Kerr was also an avid yachtsman. And according to maritime historians Hugh Murphy and Martin Bellamy, while Kerr was visiting the opening of the Kiel Canal in Germany in 1895, and the contrast he noted between the monochromatic French and German vessels and the multicolor British ships got his mind thinking about how you could apply obliterative coloring to a ship. Even before Care, uh, there was an American artist named Abbott H. Thayer who was also working on concealing coloration through the use of countershading, and he was doing that as early as the Spanish-American War in the late 1890s. And what that means is that darker colors would be painted on the top of a vessel to counteract the reflection of the sun, and then lighter colors would be near the bottom, and they would sort of be banded in like a hardline gradient. Care and Thayer actually knew each other, and they talked about their different ideas and points of view on how to best conceal a large object through the deliberate use of paint color. And September 1914 was a particularly devastating time for the British Navy. Uh, In the course of just a few weeks, German U-boats sank the HMS Pathfinder, and then uh, on the same day, a little bit later, the HMS Abukir, the HMS Hogue, and the HMS Cressy. And on September 24th, after all of these had taken place, Kerr wrote Winston Churchill a letter outlining three different ideas that he had for camouflaging ships. The first method involved color matching the habitat, but he also noted this was really a lot better for small animals than large ships. And the second approach that he mentioned was more in line with some of the ideas that Thayer had had, uh, although Kerr called it compensation shading. And he basically described a gradient painting technique that involved coloring the darkest and most shadowed parts of the ship's bright white, and then the areas that were exposed to the most light uh, being painted the darkest shades of gray, effectively creating sort of a monochromatic blob that had no visible detailing, at least if you were looking at it through a periscope. The third method outlined in Kerr's letter to Churchill describes a paint application similar to the dazzle coloring that Norman Wilkinson is associated with. He described this idea of party coloring in the following way. It is essential to break up the regularity of the outline, and this can easily be affected by strongly contrasting contrasting shades. 
The same applies to the surface generally. A continuous uniform shade renders conspicuous. This can be counteracted by breaking up the surface by violently contrasting pigments. A giraffe or zebra or jaguar looks extraordinarily conspicuous in a museum, but in nature, when not moving, is wonderfully difficult to pick up, especially at twilight. The same principle should be made use of in painting ships. I had to kind of chuckle to myself when I was reading that initially that he only placed animals in museums, <laughs> like, like not in any sort of live uh, viewing enclosure like a zoo at the time. Right. It just made me chuckle. As an aside, uh, Care very specifically described the need to break up the continuity of a ship's outline with these high contrasting white shapes, uh, including masts with the irregular banding of white striping. This letter was actually well-received. Kara got a thank-you note and the assurance that this information and ideas would be shared with the rest of the fleet. And they were indeed. Uh, In fact, the contents of Kara's letter were included verbatim as part of a general order issued on November 10th of that same year. The order, which went out with the title Visibility of Ships, Method of Diminishing, went out with the instructions that the use of the information included was at the discretion of the officers on their various commands. And several of them did opt to try these ideas out. It was through a personal connection that John Graham Kerr found out his camouflage concepts were actually being put into use. A former pupil of his was serving on the HMS Implacable and wrote Kerr a letter telling him that everyone on all levels of naval service agreed that these were good ideas and that the student had seen another ship employing the disruptive painting style. And I would just like to have a side note that I love that there is a ship called the HMS Implacable. It is pretty charming. Uh, Exactly how many ships ended up adopting this disruptive painting technique that was based on CARE's instructions is really pretty hazy. Uh, Since the practice was at the discretion of individual commands, there really wasn't a system in place to account for its usage. Like, nobody had to report in that they had painted their ship this way. And additionally, there's evidence that some crews were actually using very similar techniques on their own prior to the general order on visibility of ships. As more and more ships started to adopt the whole party color paint schemes, Kerr was actually able to see some of them. He wasn't exactly delighted, though. He really felt that the spirit was there, but the actual execution was not quite what he had in mind. So in 1915, he wrote another letter to the Admiralty, and this time he suggested that these new camouflage paint jobs could be even better with a bit of guidance and advice from him. He got no reply, so he wrote again and again, only to learn that Churchill had moved on to a new post. And then he wrote to Churchill's successor, Arthur Balfour. Yeah, he was big on writing the letters. Uh. I feel like (laughs) this is like when the person writes to us with like really, really pedantic something and we answer back and then the person just keeps writing it again. (laughs) And I'm like, please, I stop. Well, initially he wasn't getting a reply, but he really felt like they needed to listen to him and let him help some more. Uh, And all of this writing kind of fell on deaf ears. He finally received a polite thanks but no thanks style letter uh, informing him that there had actually been a decision made that they were going to go back to painting all of the ships a uniform gray and stop all this crazy color variation. I have a feeling this just disturbed him immensely, which probably carried out by the fact that then he redoubled his efforts. He wrote to multiple officers of the military. He wrote to his friends in academia, to anybody he knew who had any connection to the Admiralty. So when Abbott Thayer was visiting from the U.S., he wrote the Admiralty again and begged for a meeting so both he and Thayer could share their information. All of those roads led to dead ends. Yeah, he really didn't. uh, They kind of... just went nowhere. He did allegedly have some luck. He also wrote about uh, someone else about uh, camouflage on airplanes and got some ground there, but uh, no, nothing with the ships ever again. So when the decision was made to adopt Wilkinson's dazzle coloring in 1917, It was much more organized than previously. So instead of leaving it up to each individual command to adopt some kind of geometric camouflage, this time it was a uniform order. 
And in addition to the order, Wilkinson was actually put in charge of a new Dazzle department. And as a consequence, uh, while he was heading that department, approximately 4,000 merchant ships and 400 Navy vessels were painted in this manner to try to avoid uh, U-boat attacks. For his part, Kerr stated publicly that he was happy to see the camouflage scheme being implemented, but he also enlisted the assistance of fellow academics to once again contact the Admiralty and suggest that he, being the only man who had years of study of this type of visual disruption, should be advising them on it. I sound weary. Because because you can imagine getting like 17 letters from this same guy that's be, like... Because we do get 17 <laughs> letters from the same guy. Yeah, where it's like, you're doing it wrong. You, you, can, just, you can just contact me the next time <laughs> you want to do a podcast on Paraguay and I will help you out. Which is awesome. I mean, we certainly appreciate when people want to be helpful. It's the doggedly non-letting go of it. <laughs> yeah, which happens not just to... I mean, in life that happens. Yes. It's like when you have... Uh, a relative who is like, hey, you can sew. Will you make me some pants? And it's like, oh, I don't really have time for that. I'm, oh, it would be great if you'd make me some pants. You know, you need pants. I'll tell you how to make them. Like, I've had those. I'm sure you've had similar when people know you can sew. There's a point where you have received the information and saying it more doesn't help. I understand you want some pants. <laughs> yeah. I am not giving them to you. It's similar. So care probably wore some people down. Um, but... The uh, the military really felt, even though Kerr made his case over and over, that the designers that they had put in charge of Dazzle Camouflage, so they came from a design background rather than uh, a natural sciences background, had things well in hand. They felt like they had it covered. And eventually, Kerr gave up on trying to be involved in the process as an advisor, and he did stop writing. While Kerr gave up on trying to offer his assistance, he did remain quite irritated that Wilkinson got all the credit for what he felt like was his idea from years prior. It became a big issue between the two men. Uh, yeah, Wilkinson's claim was that his designs had nothing to do with biology or nature and that Kerr just simply did not understand the visual principles that his approach employed that he was working from a design background. This is not about replicating nature. And Kerr's counter-argument was that Wilkinson could not have invented dazzle camouflage because no man could have invented dazzle camouflage because they were merely replicating what existed in nature already. I raised my eyebrow. I know. I know. My heart goes out to him, but I just... I, <laughs> if he were alive today, he would just be leaving comments all over the internet. <laughs> Yes, he would be an internet commenter for sure. Kerr even went back to his favorite addressee of correspondence, correspondence, Winston Churchill, to try to convince him that he should make sure people understood their correspondence of 1914. Yeah, he wanted Churchill to come out and say, oh, no, I did talk to this guy. He he had this idea before, but... Uh, eventually, what happened was that a committee of inquiry was established to investigate the competing claims. And it's unclear whether Churchill had anything to do with that or not, or if people were just so tired of getting letters from care that they were like, we have to figure out some way to resolve this. Um but the committee, uh, because Kerr's work was based in nature, it seemed that they really felt that his end goal for the paint scheme must have been invisibility, because it, to them, camouflage in nature is about hiding. Even though a lot of Kerr's writing on the matter clearly states that he felt that invisibly invisibility was going to be impossible, whereas uh, they felt that Wilkinson's approach was geared towards distortion, and uh, the committee basically favored Wilkinson in their findings. And it was still not over. No, it's never <laughs> over. Kerr took his claim next to the Royal Commission on Awards and Inventors, and while Kerr took great pains to assemble an extremely thorough brief filled with evidence, the commission found in favor of Wilkinson again in 1922. And this decision was based almost entirely on Wilkinson's testimony that he had no prior knowledge of ships painted to Kerr's specifications, although Kerr and his lawyer continued to assert that this statement was completely false. Yeah, there was some evidence that uh, Wilkinson had been in places where ships that were painted with uh, the designs that Kerr had suggested were, and that he would have been basically blind to have not seen them. Um but even so, just by virtue of saying, nope, I never saw those before, uh, Wilkinson won out in the end. But what really sort of makes it all kind of funny to me uh, in a uh, morose sort of comedy is that it really didn't matter who came up with the idea. Because a study of the e efficacy of dazzle camouflage that was conducted in 1918 
determined that it really had no measurable impact on evading attack. It really didn't help in terms of military strategy. And that its greatest benefit was that it had probably just raised the spirits and morale of the men. Which there's something to be said for that. But in terms of like claiming it as an invention, they were fighting over nothing, basically. Yeah. Well, and I think part of the reason that he irritates me so profoundly (laughs) is that he reminds me of younger me who would just doggedly pursue a matter of principle that did not actually matter. Oh yeah, I've that done that much. for sure. That I but but you are wrong and I am right. <laughs> Why don't you understand this? Yeah, and that was the thing. He didn't really want money out of it. He did have to make a financial claim in that second uh committee hearing. Like he had to make a claim that he needed something out of it. But really he didn't want any money. He just wanted people to acknowledge that it was his idea. And really, there had actually been cases of ships, like I said, that had been painted like that even before him, some of which kind of happened just accidentally because the ships were being repainted and paint mm-hmm. was flaking off. They had started to kind of accidentally do some of that and then thought, oh, that might be interesting, and they would continue it. So the, he was, they were just fighting over nothing. Yeah, well, and as we have talked about frequently, anytime there has been science or invention in the podcast, Almost always progress, it developments build on the things that happened before them. They don't come out of thin air. Yeah, there are very few true eureka moments where someone just thinks of something no one has ever thought of before. <laughs> uh, um, earlier this year, uh, German artist Tobias Renberger and Venezuelan artist Carlos Cruz Diaz were actually commissioned by the Liverpool Biennial, Tate Liverpool, and the World War I Centenary Arts Organization called 1418 Now to recreate dazzle camouflage designs on several ships. And the work that these artists were commissioned to do was part of a series of events marking the 100-year anniversary of the start of the war. Renberger painted the HMS President, which was a 265-foot flower-class sloop, originally named the HMS Saxifrage, and built in 1918 for anti-sub warfare. The President is permanently kept in London and was painted with da- with dazzle camouflage during World War I. I love that there is such thing as a flower-class sloop, and I particularly love that it was named the Saxifrage. Yeah, that's, that's, those are both fun words to associate with ships. <laughs> Uh, Remberger's painting turned the ship into a really uh, fabulous optical illusion so that it looked like piles of almost Escher-esque kind of modern pipeworks. Um, and he was actually a perfect choice for this project because he, uh, in interviews, he commented that he had discovered or found out about uh, Dazzle Camouflage like 20 years ago. And has just been fascinated with it ever since. So much so that in 2009, he actually, uh, when he was commissioned to design this uh, cafe, he based the entire design on the principles of uh, dazzled design and visual confusion, which may or may not make for um, a fun dining experience. If you like visual stimulation, it's probably super fun. In Liverpool, Cruz Diaz worked on the Edmund Gardner. This one is more basic, but still visually stimulating design, consisting of red, yellow, black, and green striping. Yeah, it's uh, in one of the the links in the show notes that we'll have. It um, they have a time lapse of of the um, the Edmund Gardner being painted, and it's kind of wonderful because it goes from being a flat kind of matte gray to looking like this really wonderful Rasta adventure ship because yeah. of the colors that he chose. And it's and we'll, very cool. We'll pin stuff up on our Pinterest so you can see what these look like. Oh yeah, Pinterest is going to be a busy place with the Dazzle because there's a lot of good pictures of Dazzle. Right now it's really busy in our our unearthed board because <laughs> there's just been a lot going on in the unearthing in the last few weeks. There always is, but it's been a really high concentration of fascinating things being pulled out uh-huh. of the ground. Which is great. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Saturday Classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcasts at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. 
Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 